Welcome to Conversations with the Authors. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome <laughs> back to Conversations with the Authors. I'm your host, Daniel. And I am Daryl. And I'm Sandra. Today, we're going to take another look at uh, metaphors and symbols and creative writing for How Nicholas Became Santa Claus, your highly rated uh, Eric Hoffer nominated sci fi fantasy novel. First, thank you again for letting me do this thing. Thank, thank sure. you, dear listeners and readers, for pressing the play button. And thank you, Alexander Nakarada, for your intro, as always. So, this whimsical journey through this creativity, this, this world of how Nicholas became Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. um, so many fantastic and creative elements. There's great, grand descriptions. Uh, there's exciting, uh, you know battle scenes and fight scenes there's love and romance there's chaos there's all the, the whole gambit that you might expect to see in a fantastic story uh, and part of the thing that goes into writing a great story oftentimes is symbols and metaphor we talk about symbols a lot in you know the catholic religion we talk about idolatry and this and that and so uh, but for some of our new readers and listeners, can we briefly sort of explain, in your opinion, what symbols and metaphor are? Well, metaphor is uh, when you directly state that one thing is something else. Mm -hmm. you know, and it, it's kind of like time is a thief. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, time can't be a thief, obviously. Right. But it, it's probably a very uh, uh, imaginative way of mm -hmm. telling someone that uh, aging is inevitable and uh, that time is something that you if you be cautious of right. because it will take your time away from you. Yes, yes. You know, and I think it's an elegant way to say something. And uh, it creates a lot of uh, imaginative images, metaphors mm -hmm. do. We we kind of touched on that a bit because we talked about metaphors and and, and cliches and other things of that nature. Uh, I I think a, a fresh metaphor can express a lot and uh, can symbolize a lot of things uh, that uh, that help you imagine more in a, in a story. And it seems that uh, in your story, Sandra, that you uh, expertly crafted with your husband. <laughs> Uh, dad, <laughs> uh, mom, <laughs> is is everything seems to have a meaning to it. Everything seems to have. Uh, uh, I used a ton of symbols in the the story because I find them to be very reflective. Mm -hmm. There's an old metaphor that says, "Waste not, want not." Yes. And so when you're writing, don't waste your words. Yes. You know, and so be very concise, be as mm -hmm. concise as you can. Say what you mean to mean what you say. Yes, yes. And that just, that whatever your words are, they can't be taken any other way. Right. Yes. You think so, Sandy? I do think so. Mm -hmm. And I think that also that the, your words must give a little bit of room for your reader mm -hmm. to input their own part of the conversation. Right. Yeah, and and so, these, these symbols, they represent you know, deeper ideas or yeah. themes and the elements of your story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, <clears throat> symbols, among other things, are tools and techniques in writing to contribute to effective communication. Mm -hmm. And symbolism... Uh, represents something beyond their literal meaning. They can be uh, objects, actions, or words that carry a deeper meaning and can add layers of significance to a story or text. A symbolism, you know, and symbolism can carry you through your story. It's, it's, oh gee, was I was trying to, uh, I think of, I remember when I was a kid, I, I saw uh, an old movie. It was called Journey to the Center of the Earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was this uh, uh, a clash of people that were going to travel to the center of the earth. They were going to follow the path of some fellow that went before them who never came back. Mm -hmm. 
and on each trek down through the earth, they kept finding symbols that he had constructed right. to show which way to go, which way not to go, and what might happen if you went that way. And mm-hmm. some of them were very, <laughs> some of them were direct, but some were indirect. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, and uh, in terms of um, the story elements, at least for Nicholas, we talked last podcast about the idea of the wagon in the sky. The you know, uh, kind of comes with the territory with mm-hmm. Santa Claus. Uh, but the wagon in the sky is also a symbol. It, 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 it's sort of this theme of of hope, and the color sprites are sort of like this theme of you know just the power of imagination. You know, and. To tell you a little bit of, of more about the wagon in the sky, it was a tool uh, that we use. It was a literary device uh, that that we use to kind of advance hints mm-hmm. of what was coming. Right. And it creates anticipation mm-hmm. and it creates suspense. Yeah. And in, in, re- in reference to the, the color sprites, it's like the loose emotions that people have where they don't know what to do with them. They don't know how to control them. They mm-hmm. don't know how to how to direct them. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden, when you figure that out, then you see in the color sprites how there's a purpose in that. Mm-hmm. There's a purpose in that chaos. And that chaos, use, it takes all of your senses mm-hmm. and all of your imagination and all of your study and, and mm-hmm. your timing and your self-discipline. Right. And dear listeners and readers, if it seems like I'm calling up the wagon and the color sprites a lot, it's simply because I'm not trying to spoil the story for you. There are so many fantastic characters and creatures. Uh, if you listen to season one, there are several readings that we've done, uh, excerpts from the story. And I'd like you to be able to visualize this and experience this for yourself. So I'm sort of, in a sense, pulling my punches, uh, you know. You know, in, in, in story writing, there's a, a many, many ways and many, many tools that a writer might use to try to, to bring the idea forward and, and bring up your interest in anticipation and to, to, to spark your imagination, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know if anyone has ever heard of the word onomatopoeia. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Onomatopoeia refers to words that sound like the thing they do. For instance, if one of my characters, they've done this, they shot an arrow, mm-hmm. and you hear the whoosh of the arrow. Yeah. And so and I have to spell out wish, right. you know, or something hit flat and it thwacked, or it fell down and it made a thud. That's an onomatopoeia because it's trying to uh, elicit in you uh, the feeling of that and the sound trying to get you to register that feeling of what just happened. Uh, And if any of you are fans of uh, comic books uh, or just the 1960s Batman, (laughs) you'll know Powell Kapang, you know, these word splashes that come across the page as our heroes and villains uh, uh, do their thing uh, is is what uh, Dan is is talking about. And so certainly in, in the story, it's not the characters who are using those particular words, but it's the author telling the story to try to elicit in you uh, a, a feeling of what just happened. You know, you know, f- you know, thwack, the, the arrow hit the apple on his head. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the characters are not are unaware of that. That is for the audience, so they'll know what, to, what they can see, what they can smell, you know, the pungent odor of something. I'm making that type of description as I'm writing. Mm-hmm. So there, there are things that the, the characters say, and there's things that the author, the author, or the narrator right. of the story says. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and uh, and I've talked before uh, in this book, uh, in this podcast, several times about your ability to describe uh, scenes, <laughs> Dad. Uh, and on that note, and sort of a related note, uh, I'd like to sort of understand how how can symbols and metaphors come into play when creating this 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 fantasy world 
Well, they, they can come into play because uh, uh, if, if somebody said, well, I finally found the grail, mm-hmm. you know, that elicits a whole lot of uh, imagination of, because we have some idea what we think the grail is. Right. You know, and um, so that's, that's symbolic. Mm-hmm. It, it may mean that we're closer to the goal. Right. You know, or they, you know, we found pieces of, of that, uh, uh, that uh, fountain of youth. You know, uh, so and in 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 how Nichols became Santa Claus, there are many fascinating characters, uh, some good, some bad, some there. You know, uh, and the question then becomes: uh, for those good and bad characters, and those that are simply there, are NPCs, as we mentioned in one of the previous yeah, podcasts. And then play, play. Um, there were video games. How how does uh, symbol and metaphor come into play when developing uh, complex characters? Well, sometimes you need to have a bunch of extraneous characters mm-hmm. in order to make your main character or the character you're trying to get across his intent. Well, you know what? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's an old saying that, that people uh, believe what they see. Yes. And so you may have a description of a character, for instance, who's tall, dark-haired, and he's got a a, 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 a goatee beard and very sharply shaven, mm-hmm. and he has piercing eyes. And uh, he might have uh, slightly long fingernails and a muscular right. bill. And he looks... In your mind, I've painted a picture of someone who might be devilish. That is symbolism. Right. Yes. And you're not going to immediately say that this guy with these black fingernails and painted and uh, right. with his goatee is good, a good guy. You're not going to say right. that. So it's symbolic. And, and, and uh, speaking of metaphor, uh, one of the most popular texts uh, of certainly my religion, um, we refer to our Messiah, Jesus Christ, as as the lamb. He's not an actual lamb, but there's a metaphor to that. Because yeah. of his entire life right. and so how he became yeah. right. a symbol of sacrifice. Well, yeah, and so uh, you're more likely to, uh, to see a lamb or a dove in a right. story, yes. and you're going to think that, well, that's, that's either a creator or that's, right. that's a good person. They're on a battle, a battlefield. As I would say, a good omen. Thousands yeah. are dying, right. and then suddenly a dove comes down to the leader of, uh, of, of the resistance. Right. You know, you well, wow. That's... It, it, it's it got to be a good sign. It must mean something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, I guess in, in that way, you know, symbols... Sometimes are, metaphors and, mm-hmm. and symbols lead mm-hmm. you lead your reader mm-hmm. to the anticipation yeah. of what's coming. Right. Did you know I don't know if anybody remembers uh when the Roman Empire became Christian. Right. But they became Christian under Constantine. Yes. Okay, yes, and it was about right. the 3rd century. Mm-hmm. And it became Christian this way. Mm-hmm. He was on a battlefield. Yes. He was fighting a desperate battle. Yes, that's right. And then overhead he saw he saw a comet. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. And he won. He won the the, the war, the battle. Mm-hmm. And he figured, well, this was a sign from God. That was symbolism yes. to him. And yeah. this was a sign that uh, that Rome would no no longer uh, uh, be uh, uh, the pagan country it was. But he was going to institute uh, Christianity. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. I must say though, he he did it near his deathbed. But it it did happen. I guess- and, he, and he sent his mother. Right. To the Holy Land to collect things. I can't remember. And I guess when comes yeah. Constantine, I guess it was a Helen. Helen. Uh, Helen. Right. Helene. His mother was Helene. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so layering depth in world building. Um, beyond the characters, uh, how uh, are we, I suppose I asked this question already, so I'll see if I can think of a different one. Um, balancing the use of symbols and metaphors can be challenging. How do you strike a balance? How do you strike a balance between clarity and subtlety? Well, you 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 want to do enough of one thing and not too much of the other, I think. And so, 
So you mixed me and your daddy together. Right, exactly. <laughs> right, then, right. Then, <laughs> you, you, then write it. Write what you wrote. Put it down. Come back uh, a week, two weeks later, take a look at it and see if it looks good. Mm-hmm. If it makes sense, it wasn't over the top, it wasn't understated. Uh, you can you can find the balance, and Don't you can be afraid re- to and you can and, 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 it out. and we've talked about that. You read it to others, see what they think, and don't be sensitive. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, every every bad dish uh, we put out as chefs um, gives us information about how to create a new one, how to make it better. Uh, whether it's in plating, whether it's texture, whether it's consistency, whether it's the aroma, whether it's in simply a dash of salt, um, it all goes into refining your craft. Uh, and you can't truly know success without failure, I don't think. Um, you have to fail in order and, to and also, I think it's the only way to truly appreciate when you're on the right track and doing something uh, the way you should be doing. And I think that shows... And how Nicholas became Santa Claus. The fact that you guys put in so much time and effort uh, into writing it and crafting it and presenting it to uh, publishers and finally finding uh, you know, your home uh, and uh, being treated and really getting it out there with the people are listening to the podcast, people are visiting the website, people are buying the books. We're They're so grateful. Buying the books. And my dear listeners really and readers, we thank you so much. We do appreciate you so much. Um, we're, we're, we're in bookstores in New York and in Arkansas. We've got bookstores in, in California and San Diego. We just want to get it in all places. So uh, advocate for us and, and, and read the book and enjoy it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and um, I just... <laughs> Yeah, you, what you guys do is is amazing. The, the, you're wordsmiths, really, truly. Being able to take these ideas and craft them into something that uh, you know we can hold. I love the I love the cover. The cover is beautiful. I, it really stands out. And uh, you know, hearing the pages as you turn, when you're reading page after page, I mean, you get sucked in after the first page. It's quite amazing. So I just want to thank you, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and thank you for unraveling this, you know, enchanting world of symbols and metaphors and to storytelling. Uh, and uh, you know, as we compl- conclude this, I want, I want you, dear listeners and readers, to remember that these literally devices are profound layers to your narrative. Um, you know, work on them, practice them, see what works. You know, if it doesn't work, redo it. If it doesn't sound right, rewrite it. Uh, show your friends. Show your family. Get their thoughts. Don't keep it to yourself. Everything, like I said, helps to improve. Sandy, Daryl? Practice pretending. Yeah. yeah Don't practice. be afraid to play. Yes. As we said in our last podcast on, you know, crafting like a child, um, d- imagination is key. Um, let yourself go. Uh Follow the rabbit hole. Not too deep, but follow it. You know, see where it goes. And next time, uh, if you've got some ideas, uh, hit us up. You can visit our website at troopbooks.com. You can visit our Instagram, our TikTok, our Facebook, our X, Troop Books. Uh, if you go to our website, you can visit our author page where you can pick up a hardcover or a soft cover. If you like the book, if you have ideas for the show, leave a comment. Uh, if we like it, maybe we'll talk about it next time on Conversations with the Authors. Thank you.